Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our um, webinar, which is entitled Contiguous Archipelago, The Conversation. So Contiguous uh, Archipelago is the name for our Four Nations book. Yeah? And um, if you don't know, there, there is a book produced by uh, four, the Four Nations uh, Architectural Institutes, uh, which is uh, AIA, Indonesian Institute of Architects, uh, SIA, Singapore Institute of Architects, uh, ASA, the Association of Siamese Architects uh, under the Royal Patronage, yeah? and of course, as uh, PAM, uh, the Malaysian Institute of Architects. So the Four Nations Group is an informal alliance between professional institutes of Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia who convene regularly and we collaborate closely on aspects of practice and education. This book uh, is jointly commissioned by the Institute to seek to deepen the relationship between us by anchoring it within the design discourse uh, that we share. We present a collection of outstanding buildings recently completed uh, in these four countries uh, that explore all our commonalities and our differences. In doing so, we hope to set a new platform to discuss architectural uh, culture and works in the region. And each institute uh, was responsible for selecting their own works. Yeah? So each institute sends about uh, 10 projects, but at the end, the editors, we actually uh, reduced that to 20. So in the book itself, uh, it is actually divided into streams, but essentially every country will have uh, five projects featured. And uh, if you haven't seen the book, don't worry. Uh, if you are a PAM member, you will get the book free with the upcoming uh, AM um, magazine that will be delivered to your home. So stay tuned. And with us uh, are the architects for these five projects. And I would like to introduce the first one that is with us. We have all five of them with us. The first project that we're going to talk about is Tamarind Square, uh, named after a tamarind tree, actually. Uh, it is a mixed commercial development comprising of 28 units, uh, four to five story semi-D shop offices, uh, and 72 units of three-story garden shop offices with a multi-level podium car park. The symbolic tamarind tree are planted at the north uh, east main arrival plaza, highly visible from the street. The objective of the developer was to break away from the ordinary and reinvent the sense of space with an old village charm. And uh, with us here today, we have the director of Garis Architects Nyan Bahad, architect Mok Chipan, who will be presenting this project and um, the unique things about this project to you. Yeah. So without further ado, please welcome uh, architect Mok. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Architect Sari. How are you? Hi, hi. Welcome. Yeah. Without further ado, please share your screen and uh, proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon again. Um, this project in Cyberjaya uh, started uh, five, six years ago. Uh, it's located basically at an important crossroad in in Cyberjaya, coming from the road from Putrajaya. Uh, diagonally across is the Multimedia University. Further down, we've got uh, Symphony Hills, and across the road is uh, Pangea. When we started uh, thinking about the project, we sat down with the client, and, and on the top of his mind, he says, we should create a place where people would meet uh, together to talk, uh, essentially build bonds, friendship, and so forth. So with this bonding, we were uh, really attracted to the idea of sitting under a tree to uh, have conversations. I mean, we talked about the good old days where we were just uh, having a makan under the tree. Of course, the project really has to finance uh, itself and be sold in the market. So the leading questions, we, as we start to form the client's brief, we thought, oh, um, perhaps we should learn from presidents of uh, public squares. And being in Malaysia during the heat and tropics, uh, we felt that the idea of a tree in the square is of paramount importance. Then without uh, uh, losing any sight of what historical presidents we have from uh, Camilo Cite on all the uh, urban squares in, in Europe, 
Uh, and also not forgetting our historical uh, lineage to other squares in Asia, especially in China. And as we formed our design approach, we say it's a place to learn, to share, to reflect. Uh, essentially, some exchange of ideas under the sky. Uh, we felt that it has to be of intimate scale. It must not be domineering or dominating. The courtyards, however many we create, must be connected. Uh, it should also be an oasis, accessible literally 24-7. There are no gates, no doors to close this. And it's a marketplace for trading for all ages, everyone and anyone. When we started looking at how to we shape this in the form of a building, uh, of course, uh, developers would think, okay, we should fill up the uh, setbacks. And then another part of the developers say, no, I'm going to sell this. And I think the best thing that we can sell would be semi-D uh, type of product. So thinking about these two, we thought that a hybrid of the two would work, which is a combination of semi-Ds on the outside main road. Uh, to build more volume, we stack it up uh, semi-D upon semi-D by building a uh, podium road that is above. And the main building with courtyards, it's what is the, I call it the inner treasures. So when we look at it in the horizontal layering, we first start with the external road that gives us the access to the building, followed by the internal street, which gives us access to the uh, ground level MEDs. Then we build up the podium, which will sit on top of a tree level car park with a ramp that goes up to plus three level, a main cover drop off in the heart between the two uh, courtyards and the driveway, which is in a figure uh, like an infinity figure, it goes round in like a figure eight. Then the edge of the street is, as I say, there was uh, two sets of semi D stacked on each other. Now, when we come to the vertical layering, uh, as you remember the three level rise in the from the street level we take up uh, this difference from the north gateway uh, via two sets of escalators up to the north court which then connects uh, below the um, main uh, entrance uh, drop off via the center court which sits above it to the south court which is uh, the third court that we've got linking to Tamarind switch, which was done by unit one. And uh, then it gets back to the street, which is what we call the South Gateway. So in the end, we have this uh, three-dimensional view of uh, the double-story uh, double story semi D uh, on the external uh, and the internal road, the podium, as well as the four-story cloister, which surrounds the park. Now, when we on hindsight, when we look at the vertical and the horizontal layering, we, we realize that there are a lot of similarities with uh, places that I've seen before, like uh, Libya, uh, Tripoli, where the old Medina really is uh, several concentric rings from busy roads, which are full of cars. You go down to inner roads, which only uh, horse and car, or in this case, a donkey. And innermost roads, they are only pedestrian. So when we look at this, it really has that resemblance of the Medina Square, the old town in Tripoli. And vertical layering, uh, we saw a lot of similarities in Porto, Portugal, whereby when you come in from the external uh, main thoroughfare, you go up towards the hill and you arrive at the town hall. So these were some interesting uh, precedents that we found. Now, these are sections that show you the uh, longitudinal and trans transverse sections, uh, how it arrives at the top and the court, north court, south court, and center court, they're all different layers. Uh, in a way, giving it some interest in moving up the, the squares in the building. So the portal, as we come in from the uh, external main roads, we are immediately uh, uh, greeted by the tamarind trees, as Sally has just said. The entrance is a form of a U-shape, which is somewhat welcoming in its form. The uh, semi-Ds at the front are also lined with trees. 
and it's uh, the the shelter of the corridor is well uh, made, uh, covered by from the rain by the extended uh, eaves, and the external ac escalators take up uh, the the three levels up to get to the podium driveway, which is the the uh, podium road, which is three levels up from the street. Uh, we've got many uh, uh, elements here of the uh, vehicle drop-off, uh, the screens covering the fire escapes, the lifts that take you through the building, uh, upright up to the highest floors. Uh, and then we've got the gateways to the inner courtyards, which are framed by the portals, the, the corner gateways. And when you look out back into the driveway, you get this uh, somewhat of a tall cathedral face uh, uh, form, which is uh, again lined by trees. It's covered by uh, skylights. Then we enter the first court, which is a north court here. Uh, 600 is uh, magic uh, in terms of uh, creating the, the luscious landscape with uh, ponds and uh, staircases linking each other, uh, the uh, movement through the whole place. It's, it's a light, like a hide-and-seek uh, wonderland, uh, fully uh, clothed in all these uh, luscious trees. And from the uh, drone shot from above, you would see the seven pinnacles, which uh, at one stage was likely to be uh, removed, but I'm glad everything was kept uh, intact from the original design. And again, the, the visuals that you see here uh, create a very an inviting green uh, space, which does not need air conditioning. Then the center court itself is a large volume, uh, can take a basketball court, and is overlooking the north court below. The, the image on the bottom is the main drop-off area below this north, uh, this center court. And it's used for a variety of uh, functions, you know, from big Zumba uh, uh, dancers to exercise to uh, watching World Cup on a big screen. Uh, food trucks can actually drive right up into this center court, and uh, they can have a weekend of, uh, weekend fair. Uh, in fact, there were car launches, etc. So a lot of things happen in the center court. Then we move to the south court, which is a little bit more somber and formal, it's where we put the community hall, a terrace uh, overlooking the gardens on both sides. Much more linear, rectilinear, much more formal. And uh, the quietness of this has a completely different feel to it. Uh, on top of all these, we've got the roof terraces, which the, the cloisters have the uh, half floor above with uh, places that perhaps someone could use it for an outdoor activity. And in the end, of our, uh, my few last slides here, um, it's a reminder that, you know, how much we enjoy uh, being not in a, an enclosed shopping centre uh, where you can still enjoy the outdoors. And I think the, the best uh, thing that one can do in terms of a post-construction evaluation or assessment is what people leave behind or, or take from from this place as in images on instagram and and uh, sharing uh, of the experiences in, in all the chat groups these are images all from from the people that have been there and um, in the end i think uh, we have actually reimagined a different malaysian uh, shop house uh, from the traditional form and moved into something that has uh, a place in Malaysia, yet it is uh, forward thinking and looking. Okay, this is all that I have got to share today. Thank you very much. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, we will have a an in-depth discussion later with regard to this, uh, your project and also the other projects that, uh, that will be presented today. And uh, audience, please do not hesitate to drop your questions via Slido. You can see the sliding text that is uh, coming across the screen right now. Uh, that is the venue for you to ask questions. Yeah. And um, 
without further ado, let us go, go on to the next project. Actually, the next project is a mosque uh, in Cyber Jaya 10th district. Yeah? Uh, the Cyber Jaya 10 mosque is designed as a center of excellence, actually. Uh, a one-stop center to learn, live, and rehabilitate one's soul. Its facilities include an expensive green buffer park, dialysis center, multi-purpose room used for tuitions and events, open courtyard for informal gatherings, and a discrete janazah management room and garden. The proposal is not just a mosque, but a community intervention integrating communal and social needs in an effort to uplift and engage a township. So some say it's back to basics, some say it's... Uh, a rejuvenation of what a mosque can be. So without further ado, today we have with us uh, architect Ching Sao In from the, uh, the principal of Sao In Architects and also the former director of Juruteras Design Workshops Nyambahat. So without further uh, ado, uh, welcome architect Ching. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? Very fine. All right. Okay. I think, uh, can you please share your presentation and uh, proceed with the presentation? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Go on. Okay. Um, afternoon, everyone. And um, thanks for uh, the introduction, Architect Sally, um, and the good pre presentation by Architect Mo um, on the very well-balanced uh, Tamarind Square between densities and landscape. Um, uh, today, I would like to share some ideas about wood. Uh, I will share in three parts, history, climate, and people. The first part is on the history. Uh, between 8th to 14th century, uh, there was a period we call it as the uh, Islamic Golden Age. And this is a uh, Kitab al here. A manuscript, if you translate literally, it means book tricks. But if you look closely, uh, it's not literally just a, a magic trick. It's actually a combination and a collection of beautiful diagram of vowels and also tube. And if you look at this drawing, a very ingenious drawing by Al Jazari, uh, if you can guess roughly what is this drawing about. It's actually a diagram of water rising device, a combination of mechanics and also ma mathematics with camshaft, pivot, piston, and valve. It's actually a water pump uh, that invented during that time. This is in uh, Haman Sira, between 9th to 12th century. The water wheel that actually utilized the currents of the river water and the different pressure to through the piston to raise the water to the highest level. And the knowledge of all this, it doesn't happen just overnight. It was uh, collected and combined all in a place called House of Wisdom during that time. It's actually a public academy and also a library that collects book from different region and translate the text from Greek and Syrian into Arabic. And the breakthrough during that period spread through to other region, passed down to, oh, to our modern days now, the water pump that we can see. So if you look at culture and also knowledge, they are not just one chapter alone, but a continuity of events. The second part I would like to share uh, is climate. The term Malay Archipelago was named after a book by Alfred Russell Warris. It was a book about his uh, scientific expedition. He documented geography, natural history, and people of this region. And whenever we have a discourse of architecture for this region, this image of traditional Malay house always came in our mind. Uh, there is an extensive record on uh, the form of the roof in our region, on the material and how the shape looks like, 
but they are lacking of discussion on how effective of this form and what type of different roof material that we use, whether traditional or modern, and what type of profile and how the water runs on this roof, how they join and what are the angles. And most importantly, how this roof works together with other building components and elements and create the total experience of the space. Take for example, pitch roof. Pitch roof is very popular in this region because it's very effective in channeling off the rainwater. And in this diagram, if you see, by creating an opening on both sides of the wall on the opposite side, the cross ventilation can be happened and it would take a hot air out. However, because of the shape of the roof, the triangular shape of the roof, the hot air, when it rises up, it will trap in the concave area and this will actually increase the temperature of the room. Sometimes we do a ceiling to conceal this triangular concave part. It will control the airflow, but at the same time, it poses another problem of maintenance and service. You will have pests, and at the same time, the hot air still trapped in between the pitch roof and also the ceiling. So by having a jack roof, the top section at the top section of the roof, we can release the hot air and the temperature according to study, it could drop as much as four degrees. And in the case of Cyberjaya Moss, we are not creating just one, but three tier of jack roof. The roof that reflects, uh, this is the roof uh, of the moss that reflects the color of the sky. And also at the top of the roof, you can see this panchaka langin symbolize the relationship between the moss and also to the sky. The structural system of the roof and inside the prayer hall, the tear roof and the play of light. And this understanding about the roof is not a new creation, but the wisdom that we learn from all beautiful mosses that we have in the country. This is a section of the moss. There are series of veranda and also walkway sheltered by a tin roof and wrapping around the main building of the moss and open on all sides. The yellow color is the main hall and the green colors are the veranda. This is the main hall and the veranda on the side. The veranda are punctuated with opening, one side with a body of water and the other side with plantings of trees. So the water will cool down the temperature and the tree in the future when it's grown up, it will provide shade to part of the building. This is an image of the tree in the veranda. The water feature. The other thing is the location of the moss on the northeast side is actually facing the main vehicle road and also the new future shops. But at the same time, that is also a direction of the Qibla. So we design a mirror in orange color, a wall that indicates the direction of Kaaba in Mecca. It's also a direction where Muslim who face when praying, integrated together with a mimba, where Imam would stand to deliver sermons, to become a buffer for the mosque at the same time. And it's made of ram earth wall, hand compacted, using cement and soil from the earth of the site. It's a load bearing structure with the thickness can go from five feet to nine feet and it acts as a buffer to the space inside. 
and the layering effect of the compacted earth signifying the importance of the wall and it becomes a very natural backdrop for the mosque. The third part I would like to share is about people. The mosque is built with hands of many, with passions and also hard work. People involved in the projects comes from a very diverse of background. Builders who knows what works and what doesn't, who knows the cost of the materials in the back of their pump. Worker who's skilled and also willing to try and many other, regardless of their race, gender, and religion. Among them all, especially, is Ku, who pulled everyone together through his down-to-earth uh, attitude, and Alex, who always there when we needed him, and Nadia, who organized everything in drawing and set the tone for the project and Camellia who bite the bullets and improve the design of the mosque to this very exquisite level. And Daphne who plug the hole, especially in every way she can. And lastly, the client, who we often call him as uh, in his title, Tansri, but we should remember him more of his name, uh, Mustafa Kama. The final slide I would like to show is a photos of people in Jutra's design workshop. The project of the mosque remind me of one of our, our trip to Sri Lanka. We took a train that leaves the capital of Colombo to a small town down south along the coastal line. It was late afternoon evening. The train was packed like a sardine. People mostly are worker, off work and there is no aircon, no electricity and light. The train was very, very primitive. And the train door was kept open even when the train is moving. And as it moved, you can see the one side of the view is the coastal line and the other side are houses of the worker. And the wind was blowing across the train. This photo was taken when we arrived at the station, waiting the bus for our next destination. This humble experience, the trip remind me about history, climate and people. Thank you. Wow, uh, it's nice that you reminisce back about the production team. I think I'm sure they appreciate it. And uh, it seems like a very special uh, time in your life that you did the project. <laughs> yeah, it's a contribution of everyone. Wow, yeah, real teamwork. Uh, again, our audience do drop in questions via Slido. Uh, you see the sliding um, text below. That is the way that you're going to ask questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you again, uh, Sa'in, for such a great presentation. Uh, okay. We move on to our next project. Yeah. So the next project is actually a mosque, another mosque, uh, which is the Masjid di Raja Sultan Sulaiman uh, in Kelang. Yeah. So the, the this mandate was to restore uh, the mosque uh, at Sultan Sulaiman, which is a royal mosque, and it's uh, it was originally. Uh, uh, the state mosque in 1933. The restoration uh, also had to be sensitive to the needs of the congregation, which had to which had expanded since its initial completion. It was thus necessary to maintain some of the functional modifications from the 70s and 80s. The conservation process followed the principles of carrying out intervention only when necessary and restoration only when sufficient evidence was available, provided the restoration recovered the cultural significance of the place. And um, the project was done by Linear Architect in collaboration with Badan Wari San Malaysia's Nyambahat, Heritage Services Nyambahat. And with us here today, we have the co-conservator uh, with Linear Architects Nyambahat, uh, 
Madam Elizabeth Cardoza, yeah? Hi. Hi, hi. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, hi. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Uh, thank you to Pam. And, you know, I'm it's presenting on behalf of Linnea um, and my colleague, um, Helena, who was um, uh, AR Helena, who's also uh, the conservator on this project, Conservation All Architect. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> shall I just proceed? Yeah, please uh, share your okay. screen and proceed. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my screen is being shared. Yeah. Great. Am can, I, see it. can you see it? Okay, good. Yes. Right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is quite different from um, the earlier uh, project because it was a mosque that was already established. It was there. And uh, so the project brief that we had um, was to, oh, let me just start start again. The project brief is the next slide. Um, so we, we, when we first encountered the mosque, it was as uh, AR Sally has, uh, architect Sally has described it as there were already changes. And so we needed to understand what the changes were. And we tried to look at it. Really, the investigation um, was looking at it over time. And how did we find uh, the information was really looking through historical documentation, including photographs, um, to see what changes had happened. Um, and um, and about when did they happen? So in 2013, when we first went to the mosque, this is what it looked like, the image on the uh, bottom right. And if you look at the image, um, even the one beside it um, and, and the one on top, you will see that, you know, you, you see the minaret, the main form is there, the, the main dome is there. But <clears throat> by 2013, there were a lot of additional things that had um happened to it. So what we needed to do was, you know, first understand what was the project brief, which was to return the mosque back to its original 1933 form and design. Um, and that was a brief that was given to us uh, by JKR, um, working um, on the instruction or the direction of Jais, the, um, the Islamic, um, the Slango, Jabatan Agama Islam Slango. Um, <clears throat> They also wanted us to construct a new administration offices and facilities. And uh, we needed to comply uh, with the guidelines, obviously, because it was a listed national heritage building. So these were the things that we needed to understand and look at when we were trying to restore the mosque back to its original uh, 1933 form. But it had already changed. So what did we do? Almost the first thing we did was to try to understand the original uh, floor plan uh, not what it had morphed to. And these were uh, things that we, um, looking back at photos and uh, with site investigation, we were able to come up with um, some basic drawings um, for the floor plan, the elevations. Um, without These were all without the addition. So this is something that we started off with. This is kind of where we started. But in the process of restoration, we also needed to look at the interior um, of the mosque. And, and with that, images, again, were things that we used um, to, to tell us a story, apart from doing quite a lot of uh, oral um, interviews with uh, members of the Karia, uh, with um, members of the clergy as well, the Imam and Bilal, who were serving um, in this mosque, and some of the ones who had retired. Um, and if you look at this image in 1933 and the one when we first took it over in 2013, the the main prayer hall looks pretty much the same, but there were some, some, some substantial uh, changes. And the changes were really in terms of um, some of the architectural features or the decorative features being covered up. Um, so the question then was, you know, do we uncover them? And when we do, you know, how do we treat them? So we ended up um, restoring it after consultation with Jais and also um, the uh, Sultan of Selengor's office, who was very much interested in this project because they were, it is a royal mosque and it is um, in the vicinity of uh, the, the state, uh, of his palace in Klang, of the main palace in Klang. Um, the, we were told, go back to the original form, look at the brief. So the restoration process led us back to, so if you compare the image um, in 
2017 and the image in 1933. They look pretty much the same. And um, it, what was interesting is, is, you know, as people came to the mosque, all the people who had been there, they said, oh, it looks exactly the same. And in a sense, that was what gave, validated the project. Um, but within this space, uh, it, it's a huge space, um, and, and the, the volume that you see, you know, as you enter this, if you talk about, you know, a sense of, of a cathedral, a sense of, of space and of uh, the whole spiritual uplifting nature of this, uh, looking up toward the main glass dome. So this is a, a, a critical element was to restore uh, this back. We then looked at the mihrab as well. And the mihrab was the one place that was really quite changed. Um, but when we started our investigation, we saw that a lot of the what had those changes were superficial. They were um, placed over what was there originally. And what we found were the original uh, features of, of the mosque um, and the floor of the mihrab, which was this marble floor with um, really thick amber glass uh, light. Because one of the things that we realized in our investigation was also looking back at all newspaper cuttings and what uh, had been reported about it. It was talking about this place having this golden light. And um, so in the restoration, we were able to replicate and to restore back uh, the floor to its original form. So this is all again in the main prayer hall. And we moved across to the ablution, um, uh, uh, the, the wudu, the ablution um, pool uh, hall. And that was really quite substantially changed. The original uh, ablution uh, pond uh, was um, a sunken pond. It was as you would, it would have collected rainwater. And over a period of time, um, by the early 2000s, um, by the late 90s actually, um, Tanks had been built because the form of ablution um, and the manner in which ablution was taken was different. So what we needed to do was to investigate and to actually see whether the original um, pond was still there and, and should we restore it back. And ultimately the decision was yes, we should bring it back after lots of consultation with lots of people. But uh, nobody was going to take ablution in the same way. Um, they weren't going to be able to, you know, go down into the pond to take ablution. So we needed to make some modifications and bring back, uh, we uh, uh, added in um, some uh, ablution um, taps, pipes, uh, for people to take ablution, for the, the congregation to take ablution. But we opened back the, um, the form of the roof we put in this glass because we wanted to allow the transparency and the light, but uh, we were cognizant of the manner in which it was going to be used and we didn't want people to get wet and for the backsplash and things like this. So these were all sort of decisions that were taken uh, in keeping with conservation principles. Um, this I will spend a little bit of time on because the best relief here was um, one of the things that we uh, knew or had read about. Um, but when we came to the mosque, um, the earlier descriptions was it being extremely colorful. But when we first encountered the mosque, it was white um, and uh, it, it had all of these, um, all the best relief and all these decorative elements were covered and in the exploration and in the uncovering we came across um what was underneath and the original colors uh, could still be seen so a big part of the restoration included the reinstatement of the um this i suppose glorious really quite um incredibly colorful uh features um, and we could do this because uh, in this investigation what we did was we really had to do uh, quite a lot of mapping of what was there so the full extent of all the best relief I'm only going to show you a couple of images here um, were what we encountered uh, throughout the project um, and this was inside um, and uh, after the restoration and the reinstatement um, this is what we see 
And this was um, based on the mapping that we had done. And the mapping was based on what we, um, in, on the investigation, including color matching. The, um, the last part of the brief was to provide um, additional facilities for the, um, uh, for the, the use of the mosque and, 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 and their, and the congregation. And, um, they needed, uh, better office facilities, but also, um, community facilities, including, um, for, uh, a billet, uh, uh, janaza, I think it's called, um, that we had to build within, um, the space. And the old, uh, office annex was, not appropriate it hadn't it didn't provide the kind of facilities that were needed so in reviewing um the the, the setting what we did and what you will notice is the new office annex which is the uh i don't know whether you can see my arrow but the structure to the right of the mosque um is is was built on the same axis as the main mosque and on this side is the royal mausoleum so we use the axis and the direction um, of that in the placement of the office annex, but we also separated it a little bit uh, from the main building um, to show that it was um, uh, it was different. So if you look at the image here, um, it is based on a very simple uh, design, uh, but some of the elements and the features which were it found in the original mosque design, um, the way in which the treatment of the surface was was then carried over into the new uh, building. So at the end of the whole investigation, we were able to, because we were able to uncover uh, the whole, um, you know, what was underneath, what was beneath the surface, so to speak, what was hidden, um, we also came up with the full uh, original floor plan. And if you see here, this was the mosque, the original setting of the mosque. These uh, were garden uh, spaces uh, that was um, that were covered in the 1970s in order to provide for the growth of the congregation. So the congregation had gone from a, a large mosque, it was considered to be the largest mosque in Southeast Asia at the time it was built in 1933, the grandest structure, the most expensive mosque. These were all the terms that we, we, we read, you know, as we were going through it, um, for a congregation of about 500 needed to grow to one that had a congregation of about 1,500. Um, and so this setting um, in the discussion and in the decision part of, of what were we going to do, should we retain, should we remove, was actually meeting the needs of the congregation, was to allow the new structure uh, to remain. Um, this is uh, just a section of the interior of the mosque. And here you can see really quite the grand nature of, of the monumental nature of the mosque. Um, I just kind of want to end a little bit with uh, looking at what the issues and the challenges and the drivers were, because I think we had to consider the community needs, the needs of the fact that the congregation was much bigger. And so we could not reduce the size. And that was one of the things that we had to take into consideration when deciding what to reverse or which period to reverse back to. There was also the issue of the royal patronage, because again, with every decision we had to make, uh, if they were major decisions, uh, we had to consult with the Sultan's office. Um, and with his agreement, uh, we then proceeded. But there was this issue of the per certain perceptions and bias against, for example, uh, the color and the, and the decorative patterns that were in the mosque. Because one of the things that a lot of the a new congregation uh, was saying was, you know, you know, a mosque, it should be white, you know, why is it so colorful? You know, are you sure there are no um, images which would be um, uh, something that we could not accept? Um, so all of these perceptions and all of these sensitivities had to be looked at and taken care of. Um, and obviously with the ablution pond, we had to meet uh, present day bylaws, you know, we couldn't let people fall into the pond. Um, and we needed to meet conservation principles. I want to end with um, a photo on the bottom right 
which is of this man in his wheelchair. And one of the one of our drivers from the conservation perspective was he uh, had been going to the mosque. He was a congregant and had been going using the mosque from the time he was a child. And uh, when he um, but he had had an accident and he had lost um, his legs he, and he was in a wheelchair. And one of the things he, he told me, you used to see him there every day. And um, while the mosque was in use, and one of the things he told us was he wished to be able to enter the mosque and to be able to pray inside rather than, you know, hold his prayers from only from the entrance of the mosque. And um, so we made sure that in meeting um, our obligations, one of the obligations we wanted to meet was to allow and to enable uh, wheelchair access, uh, you know, to provide for uh, people like this gentleman. Unfortunately, and actually very sadly, a week before we um, launched the mosque or a couple of weeks before that, um, he passed away. Um, and I just want to end with these photos of the ablution pond being used and the launch of the mosque, the reopening of the mosque um, in 2017, um, where the carpet had been laid down, but it was of a color which was much more muted than the red that we saw um, earlier. So, um, yes, thank you. Um, you know, if you want, we want to thank, actually, I want to thank a lot of people. Um, which you will see in the credits, uh, photo credits. But also, you know, it really is quite a glorious image of, of a monumental building. I won't talk about the annexes, I haven't. Uh, but um, here you, you really will see that the restoration very much followed, um, um, was very much in keeping with the original um, spirit of the place. So our email addresses are there. Thank you. I hand back to you. Um, Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, a wonderful behind-the-scenes look at how you conserve the, the wonderful mosque. And I'm sure there'll be uh, questions and discussion further uh, from the audience later on after they uh, key in their questions through Slido. So we move on to our next project that has been selected for the book, uh, which is the Stripes Hotel. So the Stripes Hotel is basically a, um, a refurbishment, yeah? Uh, and the most distinctive feature about the stripes is the brick facade adopting this sort of nostalgic building material to showcase the local heritage with a touch of modernity whilst complementing the iconic buildings in the vicinity. The facade is constructed using a customized modular brick system that offers variations and motif over, 20, over the 20-story 20 building. So that's where the name comes from, the stripes. Um, their involvement in this book also is a, a, a sad one because we, the principal of the, the firm that made this uh, project, uh, uh, Amare Das Architect, uh, which did it with, in collaboration with YTL Design Group, uh, 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 Mr. Alexis Maria Das himself uh, passed away recently. So in a way, this is uh, the crowning glory of his work. And with us here today to represent them is architect Yap Boon Kien. Uh, he is the lead architect for YTL Design Group, uh, representing as well uh, A. Maria Das Architect. Without further ado, please uh, share your screen. Architect Yap. Hi. Afternoon, everyone. Hi. Thank you, Architect Sally, for the uh, uh, invitation. Uh, thanks for the invitations and also the uh, the brief introductions of the projects. Uh, grateful to our architect Alexis Meradas. This is a tribute to him. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, Stripes Hotels. Uh, actually, uh, we are engaged uh, by a, by the con uh, by our clients in 2014 to relook uh, into one of the redevelopments of the area in Jalan Kamunting near KL. So it, this is a pictures of the site, how it looks like back then in 2014. Uh, it's a row of uh, old heritage shop houses that uh, is very famous anchor by uh, the heritage row back then. So uh, during that time, uh, together with Alex, architect Alex, uh, we were actually wondering what we can build uh, to actually create another skyline for Kuala Lumpur. Knowing the fact that uh, 20 story is actually not a very high building, 
So what we need to do, we have to do, make a very bold statement, looking at the, the neighboring surrounding skyline. We have KLCC within the vicinity, um, KL Tower. We have a lot of nice buildings around us. Uh, what can we do? So the first thing that we, the team do is actually uh, we went down to the neighborhood. And the pictures around this neighborhood are the one that actually still there. They are still there occupying uh, the spaces. They are, they, are the, they are the guidance of the streets. They are the guidance of the whole community. So we interview them. Or we actually see them smiling. They, they have a great smile all the day. Even though it's a hardship day, they still smile. During COVID time, they still smile. So this is other, these are the people that uh, actually live around that area. So we did do some deep research back then. Uh, actually, uh, if you can see, uh, this was actually a colonial uh, uh, cinema, if you have no KL. And the yellow box is where the stripes uh, building are today. Uh, it was actually uh, a settlement of a kampong that we used to uh, house a lot of, of uh, people there that actually works in Brickfield. So uh, we, to, in order to have actually uh, a design concept for it, uh, what we have actually did do the search is actually uh, the elephants in the room, like what architect Sally have actually mentioned earlier, is the bricks. It actually corresponded to what happens in the in in, in the KL uh, in the late nineteenth century, where there's a major floods and uh, fires swept through the, around the town. Uh, Frank Switterham, uh the British resident during uh, during that time, has instructed all the building to start to construct with brick. That is actually the basic fundamental of how we use a much basic product to resemble a, a brief of 20 stories uh, uh, hotel block. So with that uh, big idea, uh, basic big idea, we actually did some research on the brick movement ar across the globe. Um, we went to London and see how bricks have developed and it came to our surprise that bricks can form in many, many ways. It can be in slanted wall, it can be a precast form. Uh, these are the places that we have visited and see how people use brick technology in a different way. So, like I mentioned earlier, they came in the precast mold that you can mold them into a different world way and that's how people built there. And uh, the reason being is because of labor costs. So everything has to be thoughtfully done. And uh, after that, we bring back the, the ideas from that from our visit in, in, in Europe and came back to do our own versions of uh, laying the bricks. So of course, uh, the first uh, bricks that we have laid and mock-up that we have done, uh, it looks good, but however, actually, it takes a lot of time to build the facade, knowing uh, and also to build in the elements into the, uh, the whole design elements as well. So uh, what happens is actually we also have a restricted timeline to complete the, the hotel within two years from 2014. So considering the labor cost and speed, what we have done is actually a day, I mean, this is a picture of a kids playing a Lego. Uh, just want to tell the story and share the story. The audience is actually a day where uh, in the afternoon that I'm, we, we can't think of anything. I saw my kids was playing a mega blocks. So that's where it's actually trigger, trigger, trigger me. And actually we inform, we do actually quickly call up everybody to say, hey, why don't we actually build the bricks in a Lego form manner? So in a manner that uh, we stick, we stack the brick without uh, any forms of uh, cement mortar. That will then help us to increase the speeds of the constructions as well as bring back the nostalgia of the space. So that's the initial stage of how we actually uh, look around uh, how do we actually we want to uh, make the statement bold. From a common brick, we actually investigate into engineering brick to a brick selections that we start to develop our own bricks using the mold. So we come to into, into a lot of color selections uh, together with the type of molds that we have seen. And uh, these are the photos of actual constructions on site. Uh, this is off the site, basically this is somewhere in the kampong uh, where we actually engage a group of people that is actually uh, uh, happy with this, our crazy idea, start building bricks using different type of mold. And uh, all the brick was actually then sent over uh, to a factory to actually do a QAQC for a strengthening base. Because basically, the bricks that we are presenting today, the bold statement that we are presenting today, is actually a load-bearing wall. So this is how, after that, 
each bricks will then slot in together into a series of, of wall form that we have selected, uh, that we have actually generated in. They are in total 151,263 1, brick piece of bricks that we have actually put in into this effort of building. And we actually used uh, about approximate three months to build this brick. Should we have actually used uh, a different manner to use it using the normal mortar and uh, the patching of, of, of a normal laying bricks, it will have taken us more than nine months. So this is something, a feature that we have actually worked on. Actually, we have worked hard uh, behind the scenes with architect Alex over the nine months just to prepare the things to be done to be launched on site. So uh, this is where the site situated, uh, Jalan Kamunting. Uh, if you can see the back picture background behind, you have KL Tower and KLCC within the vicinity. So in order to make a bold statement in between the three, the three love triangle, the bricks actually is the one that we actually have, we have created and we have actually uh, uh, decided and selected for it. We, even though uh, we also bring in the, the bricks elements into the ID part by forming the arches, uh, to actually as resemble the what that we the, the part of the facade that we are conserving from the original photo that I've shown you earlier. So these are the part of the images that we have actually we also bring them through the public area. Uh, some some images on level three. Uh, and uh, these images on level three is actually quite an interesting part. Uh, like we always did as an architect, we when we went to a, a site visit, we actually took a lot of photos. And one of the photo that actually captured was actually the photo of a tin can, tiffin can, and also a data rate. That was actually, this was actually part of uh, the setting that was left behind in the abandoned building. We actually borrow the language actually and actually resemble back into a new ID feature. So this actually, when the client went there, actually the client actually give us a big smile. Actually, they, they actually reminds them of what is being done previously and that this is, something that we have uh, tried to uh, reinvent the view uh, in a much modern way. In the on, on, top of, uh, of, on top of the public area, there are, 11, there are nine, 10 floors of our rooms uh, from level 11 to level 20. Each room will have uh, uh, its own little view that actually created, crafted uh, carefully by the arrangement of the facade and also the fin. So you can see some of the uh, of, of the rooms that actually are all blocked by by the by the brick. But however, uh, the morning suns uh, uh, actually give uh, the sense of actually uh, brightness into the thing. And some of the, the room will actually have a perfect view of a KL Tower and also KLCC. Going to, to the top uh, of the pool, we we actually reshuffle it and then actually it's part of the uh, amenities requirement for the pools that we create the pools on the level 20 that actually facing the KL Tower and also KLCC. So this is uh, uh, another features that uh, features in, in this uh, pictures is actually the hanging the hanging uh, timber blocks uh, on the ceiling uh, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, pool bar. So this... Um, this hanging pots of the ceiling, ceiling things was actually uh, a reminder for us of, of, of some of the plastic bags that, that, that were used to hang around the, 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 the shop houses that was abandoned. So we actually took uh, the, the shapes and of it actually to, to put on top of that to resemble the usage of, of how it used to be. So these are little, little story that we have actually uh, engaged into uh, the touch of the things. So, um, the remnants of the existing building at the site actually edge the refurbished facade um, that is actually the stripes. Remember what is before and projecting what is to be. So uh, the bottom, uh, the bottom white color brand band of uh, heritage facade was actually part of the requirement to conserve. So the brick was actually well seated on top of it. So it's part of uh, uh, the new blend for the new new site as well. So the pre and the post. What happened is actually. Uh, if you can see the transition of the space from 2014 uh, with a pre pretty rundown area, a very dark area where a lot of drug locks are there, to after the construction, the site has actually transformed uh, tremendously. So a little bit of the entrance of Stripe, uh, Stripe Hotel, the, the entrance of the Stripe part, uh, Hotel was actually not part of the conservation. It was actually part of uh, the originals uh, uh, ID office, the first ID office for uh, for our clients. So this is the first corporate office that was supposed to be there. And uh, today, this first corp uh, 
uh, we actually use these statements to become the entrance to the site. So now Stripe Hotel, after we built the Stripe Hotel, it actually brightened the site and it become a catalyst to the site and it become a site influencer to the site. But if you can see uh, opposite us, it was used to be an abandoned car park. It used to be an open car park. And now it become a very grand cafe uh, that took a like most of the bricks elements that we have used across. Uh, along the street as well, we have uh, one of the old, old houses still there. Actually now has retrofit become a popular uh, fish, head, fish head noodle. So, uh, Technically, what we have done is actually we are, we are, we are actually giving back uh, this, uh, the community uh, a new face of uh, uh, area, which is brightened up and you become a catalyst to rejuvenate the site uh, by doing these projects. And this is a bold statement that we're trying to create in this project. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Poon, for that presentation. Uh, yeah. Again. I would like to ask the audience to just key in all your questions via Slido, yeah? And uh, we'll, we'll get you again, uh, Boon, after this for a discussion. Yeah, yeah? sure. Thanks, Ali. Uh, thank you. With, with thank that, you. we move on to our next project, uh, which is the UOB building in Georgetown, yeah? Uh, which is actually the new Kazana and Ting City offices. Uh, the restoration and adaptive reuse of the UOB building is the first Malaysian conservation project to attain um, US-based LEED Gold uh, Green Building Certification. Yeah? Uh, it, ex it exemplifies the need to recycle the existing building stock in the World Heritage Sites in a fashion which embodies a uh, benchmark standard, extends service life with contemporary options and community usage. Uh, confronted with a port site go-down space that has been clumsily converted into office and banking commercial spaces, the design approach evolved to become more than just restoration and adaptive reuse. <coughs> it reached for the highest international standards to be uh, groundbreaking, sustainable and relevant. And with us today, we have none other than the uh, PAM uh, Gold Award winner uh, and director of uh, Architect LLA Sniang uh, the man himself, uh, Architect Lawrence Lo. Hi. Uh, yeah, Professor Lawrence here. Yeah. Uh, without further ado, I think please share your screen. Uh, okay. No worries. Uh, it, I'll tell you when, when we see it. Yeah, we see it. Great. Do you see it? Yes, okay. we do. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay. Thank you, uh, Architect Zali, and congratulations to other four speakers who are very inspirational. If, I'm sure you found them as well. And they are actually a hard act to follow, but I'll try my best. Now, the UAB building, uh, I subtitled it Introducing 21st Century Spaces in the Georgetown World Heritage Site. I always like to place it within a context of time. And by the time I got working on this building, I realized I was well into the 21st century. Right? The idea was about setting benchmarks, because that is what I try to do with conservation. And the first benchmark was to integrate it into 21st century spaces. And the second one was to promote environmental sustainability and its compatibility with heritage conservation in Malaysia, something that um, has not been done as far as I could tell when it came to conservation work. So as architect Zali mentioned, it won the first lead goal status, right? Which combines a programmatic response that increases both the resilience of the site, incorporates innovative design features, as well as a wide ranging set of ideas. Sorry. Sorry. The client's decision to locate the building's corporate office in Georgetown was intentional as, as it had been the mandate to revitalize the historic city through best practice con urban conservation. And it was given 20 million to start a, a grants program for private sector. So the vision statement itself drove the design and allowed us to push the boundaries. Uh, 
he set various standards for us, and these were the parameters and the client's brief. It started that it had to be have a public area, it had to be multi-purpose, it has to engage with civil society partners, and then it would have to need to have semi-private and private spaces, right? But the interesting thing was that the client said, I have five parameters. He was very clear. He said, the first is legacy. So he wanted it to respect and to reflect tradition. The second, he said, I want it to be progressive. And so he referred to the dynamics of a Malaysian vision and to link that vision to the future. He spoke about balance, private and public. And he said, aesthetics is very important. So the look and feel of the place uh, is something that we should pay attention to. And the last but not least, he said, collaboration because he believed in partnerships and he believed that without partnerships, uh, we would not be able to move the aesthetic paradigm, the conservation paradigm, the business paradigm. So he said, I want it to be a flagship and I want it to set a benchmark. And he said, first part that I want to you to imbue into the space was a sense of inclusivity, uh, a word that now it's very popular, but then to hear it come from a corporate player was very inspiring. He said, I want it to be collaborative, democratic, participative, and it must reflect local and cultural placemaking. He said it had to be innovative. So he, I want you to look at creativity. I want you to look at the environment. I want you to look at transformation. And I want you to make it a spontaneous space. And the third pillar is that I want to see entrepreneurship working within the space because it was not to be a conventional space, but someone that space that actually pushes the limits. So it says at that time, we started to look at co-working, we looked at startups and we looked at prototyping. And so this was the mandate that I took into consideration as we moved on. So looking at re resilience of the site, I started to look at the spatial uh, context of Georgetown. And so what was typical, typical of the spirit of place was actually the shop house and its spatial composition. Then we started to think of how do we dissect the site and look at different parts of it, right? We're re rearranging the spaces in order to fulfill the mission. So ultimately, it was about adapting and engaging. And in engaging, we looked at all the different requirements. We looked at flexibility. We looked at how to create collaborative workspaces that go hand in hand with activated spaces and engaging the community. But activation and resilience doesn't stop, just stop with the building. It also looks at the precinct and we had the mandate to also look at the street. So we looked at the street, we looked at how we would increase vibrancy, we saw how we could bring climate adaptation into the space. And we really looked at the whole project as a way to catalyze action within the, the street, which was uh, China Street God itself. And then he gave us a percentage. He said, it, the place had to be 50% private, so it was office space, and this one was for Kazana. 20% uh, semi-private. So we will, that's where we engage with the outside, with the public, and 30% public. And so this is how we started to look at the spatial configuration. The, the first thing that we did, which is the most important part, is to look at stakeholder consultation. So we applied these steps, right? I look at five steps when I look at stakeholder engagement, right? And we always end up after uh, we've gone through these five steps and then we get engaged in the design stage. So here, right from the very start, we create, created pop-ups in order to uh, introduce a space to uh, the whole Kazana team of 200 people who came down to visit the site. 
and we end up with wonderful spaces where that we could have children's workshops, we could have uh, other exhibitions in a space which is for rent 24-7 all year round. Typically, we handed out uh, these guide forms and we started to tick the boxes to see how we would use the space in terms of uh, the way that the tenants would want them. And we looked at the existing spaces and recorded what they did best or worst in their spaces. So the, so the most important thing about the building also was its transformative effect. So you can see in the photographs the before, which was actually a bank, right, then stripped out. And after, where this became the main pivotable space for Kazana itself. Uh, here we had to make a very interesting decision. I had walked in and out of the building for a month trying to decide how and to design the spaces. And I felt there was something missing. And I felt that there was no connection from the ground floor to the first and to the sky. And so I persuaded the client to allow me to take away one slab within one grid and provide them a grand staircase up to their first floor. They accepted it and this is what happens. Although we actually had to give up very expensive floor space, it made up in terms of its connectivity. And sometimes I find that a very simple move uh, changes the whole idea of the space. But what we have done and managed to do with this project is that we have started to activate the space around it and we found the opportunity to engage with other players and at the moment at this moment in time we have actually put together a proposition to create what we call a cultural and design district where we feel that the empty buildings can be repurposed and we can invite new players into the site to actually start a new district within the World Heritage Site in order to move beyond just uh, basic housing or basic shop houses and into really a comprehensive holistic approach. The innovation in the design came in many ways. And this is how we overcome the constraints. This cross section, in fact, shows what I call a light lantern, which is at the top of the space. And we felt that we had to use this feature and invite the, the quite very, very special lights to come right down to the basement. And that's where the open opening in the floor took place. Then obviously we had to look at the ecological approach, right? So we had to integrate ecological considerations that were compatible or not compatible with heritage guidelines. And this was pivotal in getting us the lead goal uh, rating. Right? We had to look at energy and atmosphere. We had to look at indoor environmental quality, water efficiency, material and resource use. and we went through the rating, you know, through all the stages in order to attain uh, the, the right rating for the goal. So these are some of the finished spaces. These are the plans, the historic uh, streetscape. So what we did on the ground floor, there were three bays. Two of the bays, we turned them into multi-purpose halls. And we connected the, the third bay where the Kazana office was with this five-foot gallery. In the original building configuration, the facade engaged directly with the street and there was no transitional space and that bothered me a bit. So when I looked at the, the morphology and the type, typology in Georgetown, the five-foot way was a very, very prominent uh, facet. So what I did was I created this, uh, almost this empty space within the user spaces to, to replicate the five-foot way. And when you go to the space, you'll find that this intermediate space actually 
although a very simple solution, actually helps the transition into the inside of building. This is the layout on the first floor where uh, they were turned into both private offices as well as a multi-purpose hall in the center. And the, the next two bays was where Kazana had their main office. Over each space, as I explained, there's this lighting uh, skylight, which brings light and ventilation right into the space. And that also helped us uh, tackle the environmental factor of light. So at the end of the day, I really had to think of a phrase to encapsulate what we're trying to do. So I actually told my architects, what we are doing, we are using the language of the old to tell new stories. And we are using the language of the new to retell stories of the old. And they took that on board um, very, very seriously. So I guess at the end of the day, I will have to leave the last word to Pam. They were kind enough to call it the building of the year in 2018. And we actually got the Pam Go Award for Adaptive Reuse. In it, they said that exact, exam, exemplary edifice, which not only honors its rich architectural lineage, but also resolutely demonstrates the innate connection to nature and natural processes to enhance health and well-being of spaces, work, play, and live in. With that, I would like to end my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you, thank you, Lawrence, for such a wonderful uh, insight to the 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 building of the year for that year. Yeah, uh, I think uh, we have come to our uh, moderation session where we bring back all the speakers. Uh, we would like to welcome back uh, Architect Mo, Architect Cheng, uh, Madam Elizabeth, uh, Architect Yap. Yeah. Perhaps uh, as the editor for Malaysia, uh, it, it is been an honor to, to forward your projects uh, for the for the compilation in the book. Lah. And I think uh, the book, the book chief editor, uh, which is uh, SIA, uh, tried as much as possible to create a narrative uh, that binds us all as countries. So perhaps uh, a common... Uh, a common tie that tries to bind us all uh, is that of uh, religion, uh, density, and uh, all that uh, that we have discussed in, in the book. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I hear some noise, but I'm not sure where it's coming from. Uh, it's okay. Uh, the yeah, the, um, the mosque um, in my neighborhood. Ah, okay. Is that a no part of that? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Uh, as long as we know, uh, I think the organizers will help with the, the muting and tuning down the noise. Uh, as I was saying, uh, the theme for the, the, the current book is actually heritage, faith, ecology, and density. That, that is what binds us together. And uh, the next book uh, actually will be produced by, will be headed by Malaysia. And I'm asking, uh, all of you as people who have been involved in projects uh, in the book, uh, what is, do you think that is the common narrative that can bind us together or become the theme for the next book? Yeah, perhaps uh, starting with uh, uh, Lawrence. Uh, well, I guess, you know, the, the biggest key word today is, unfortunately, the word sustainability. It's an S, but not S as we think of it, but <laughs> sustainability and everything that connects us to what that means would be what we are really looking for, right? Uh, because in the next 10 years, even all the fuss about climate change, etc., cetera, um, those will be our biggest concerns. And if we are not able to demonstrate the path towards fulfilling those goals, um, we are all in trouble. So I guess right. that would be on everybody's lips. Uh. 
Hmm, sustainability. Yeah. Um, how about you, uh, Akitip Mok? What do you think? I, I agree with uh, Professor. You know, sustainability is very elusive. We talk about it, but seldom do we actually live it, uh, live it out. That's the sad part. Uh, the, the thing I like about uh, many of the uh, projects presented here uh, is that uh, uh, the, the, less, the lesser the use of uh, electricity for air conditioning and all that, the better it abodes for uh, our climate, uh, our, our tropical climate, which is uh, to, to some sense uh, either a, a, a boom or a bane. We either love it or we hate it. Um, right. Heritage is the other uh, topic which I feel that we have lost touch with uh, our heritage because we've got very international. We, we want to bring in the latest technology and, and quite often when we look back, uh, what really binds us together is uh, besides culture uh, uh, and, and the and the climate uh, is how we interact with each other as people. Uh, we got to get to the core of our human interaction. Yeah. Okay. Interaction with people as well as, as well as sustainability. Great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because in, in, in some ways, you know, when we talk about interaction, uh, now that we've got the experience of lockdown and, and we can do things with technology, uh, how we, how can we bring back this interaction uh, between people uh, yet still feel safe? I mean, I still have friends who refuse to go out and meet just to talk. You know, that's how sad it is. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. They, they're still afraid to go to uh, dinner and whatnot, yeah? Hmm. Uh, that being said, uh, we have uh, Sao In has showed uh, how his project team interacted with one another to, to do the project. Perhaps uh, you can have some other insight on uh, what, what, can, what can bind us together uh, in the next book. I agree on the climate and also sustainability too. And I think um, when we talk about climate, I think the response is about how efficient we can design. And although we on this, we are all in the same region. So it's but also they are about uh, sufficiency. Hmm. Efficiency. About how efficient we can put different things together uh, and also design something that could serve just not one purpose. For example, like in right. in more details, like in Singapore, uh, when it's at the area, a densely populated urban area, they have their services in the public road instead of uh, laying directly below the earth they actually create a concrete channel so the services are actually running inside a concrete channel inside below the road so whenever they need any services it goes down to the concrete channel and human can actually walk in so it saves a lot of wastage of um, opening up the roads and then patch it back again and i think this uh, about planning for long term so efficiency is also about long-term planning yeah right so the the commonality is uh in planning ahead and looking forward i guess right that's what you're trying to say yeah different regions uh, i think they have different contexts to respond it'd be nice to see uh, everyone's in details how they do it like for example in singapore they have a more uh, high dense uh, area and in our country probably have a different context yeah. correct uh elizabeth what what do you think that binds us together or uh, I, I i i just i want to um sort of like pick up on actually all all the projects which I, yeah you know i'm not an architect right which, you know, declare right at the start so i'm sitting among which you makes know, the point of view uh, uh, actually uh, valid uh, because... different, different, <laughs> different um and i think that what what I think was, was common uh, throughout was um, everybody was sort of like trying to understand, you know, what were the values uh, behind the sites, behind what 
the, you know, whether it was their briefs, whether it was sort of um, the community, what, what, so the identification of that sort of set of values, you know, to be able to um, then bring back and or interject or interpose within the new design. I mean, you look at you look at, at the, the the Stripes Hotel, for example, the, you know the mosque inside the Jaya, where you are looking at um, a particular memory, a particular legacy, which belongs uh, to that that group, the 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 very stakeholders, um, or or within the space. And I think it is the fact that, and I think that's what really has made the project so successful. That that you have right. been able to draw upon. Um, I I look at at the um, the first project that was being, um, although it's completely new, it's you know the density of it uh, compared to all the others. Let's say, um, is, but the drawing upon I think a certain identity and certain legacy which relates back to to the place and the people and our our. The, the, so the legacy of the nation and the legacy of our different communities, the legacy from our history and that identity and then, and then using that almost as your launching pad to develop and to progress your ideas. I mean, what Lawrence was talking about, you know, mm. the connectivity of the five foot ways, you know, what, what Bunken was talking about, even within the ID. And yeah. I think that that to me is what has linked uh, the projects um, together. Mm. So, so, yeah, I, I think the identification of these kinds of values um, that are real and that belong to um, the place and the people and the climate and the setting, that we're not borrowing from somewhere else. True, true. These context-sensitive legacies that actually uh, manifest themselves as the foundation of all these uh, very and then and then whether it's yeah. a new design whether it's in restoration whatever it is you know using that as the basis right right or a starting uh, point architect yep what do you think i think uh you have the answer from all the panels that you have <laughs> <laughs> well technically i think uh what uh, architect uh Sawin has mentioned earlier i think uh, among these four region the one that actually uh distinctive distinguishes us from the rest of the region is actually the climate and also the people and how we behave here. So um, mm. looking at the projects that uh, that was uh, presented through across today is all more on community. I think something that some of the projects in uh, Europe they not did not touch it unless unless otherwise. So I think humans, community, climates, these are the key things that actually jive and actually married the four nations together. Because how we eat in Malaysia is the same that how we how they eat in Indonesia. So whatever food the right, Thai right. like, also what we liked. So it's actually about culture, about humans, about activity, about community. And the sense of uh, the value that uh, Elizabeth mentioned earlier is actually quite true. So that, that actually merits the four nations and actually makes us uh, something special compared to the one that today, if you are in Portugal, they will build the thing differently. Correct. Yeah. Um, uh, relating to your project, uh, Boon, the, yeah. there was this is this question about the original two-story shop houses uh yeah. it was torn down in 1990 and they've rebuilt a four-story office before they reconsidered to redevelop uh, into a 20-story hotel in 2014. um uh is is there any um significant heritage traits that you have uh taken from those um uh, historic shop houses well, or is it a reconsideration the reconsid or? the first reconsideration that we have uh exactly was actually uh since that that is actually a four story it's actually also a hit start of the the, the so-called the row of shop houses the site was actually a 10 row of shop houses a 10 shop houses in a row and the four story was actually a hit start for the project and it's also a catalyzed sure. uh during that time in 1990s so uh, of course, uh, YTL grew big, and then they actually had Correct. their own HQ somewhere else. Uh, the building was abandoned subsequently uh, after the late uh, Tan Su Tatin actually passed away. So mm. um, then, when the when the when the client decided to de develop that uh, in 2014, so actually they give us the insightful that oh that will be a gateway, and that's what uh, we actually put in the entrance for the Strap Hotel. 
So it actually gives some memory to the clients as well as uh, the, the, actually the statements on site. Because as for uh, the neighborhood, they actually know the building very well. Mm -hmm. So that during that time, this is the only building that actually they're approachable because this is the only building that is actually new. The rest was actually quite tear down, quite worn down. So today also, this is also a new, uh, it's also a gateway to a new hotel that the, the, that the community is actually uh, building up now from there. So uh, YTL was actually was part of the community as well during that time. So this is uh, the value that actually they are creating. And uh, the good things about it is actually the community members that we show earlier. These are the people that we are still taking some foods from them during some riot breaks. Some, these are the small get texture that, uh, that, that I mean, the community is supporting among each other. That, uh, that that we were sharing earlier about humans, about community, about people. Yeah, but the uh, what some would would argue that this community does not uh, directly benefit from having uh, such a high end hotel there. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, some may argue, but uh, if you can actually look into the site today, if you have visited the Jalan Kamuntin itself, I think uh, you can ask most of them; they actually benefit from that. I mean, apart from the people, so the crowd that the, uh, I mean, we are drawing in because of the hotel that are making a bold statement. Uh, mm -hmm. They are also in, in another way clean up the whole site. You will, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you was used to be a, a drug area where you have a gangster, you have a lot of uh, fights there. You know, even in our during our construction time, that I would like to share, we were also threatened by all these people, <laughs> and I was one of the victims. Wow. And we have to call <laughs> our police. Although we just beside the police station, we have to call the police come to sort out all these things. But, okay. but well, well, it start to bright up the place, and then the people are safe to walk. And if you can see today, uh, that area like it's like booming, a new a new area that was expand from a heritage road that we used to know. So more of a sort of like a gentrification. Yes, it's also a catalyst that actually rejuvenate uh, the whole site as well. Okay. Uh, architect Mo, there is uh. Uh, your project is uh, absolutely wonderful. Uh, the I think the most interesting thing for me is that uh, transformation of scales. Your your idea of courtyards uh, is always applied to smaller scale uh, buildings, and suddenly now it's applied to uh, such a large scale development. And uh, it still feels very personal. It still feels very uh, intimate, rather than. Uh, and I think that is why uh, it, it won an award because uh, it does not have that that clinical feeling of uh, a condominium or a, a big residential uh, high rise uh, plot. Yeah. Um, but the, the question begs. Uh, the question that I, I would like to ask is that whether um, the F, the the value of uh, having courtyards. Uh, over something that is far more efficient um, commercially uh, is there any is there any like quantifiable returns from it well if you look at any uh shopping mall the inevitable atrium space you know the the the, the open space between the two uh department stores which are a little bit yeah. uh, old-fashioned now huh? Uh, you can also say that 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 is an empty space. Uh, essentially, we're just filling that space with greenery, mm -hmm. and nothing really, uh, you know, either calms the souls or or uh, feeds to the human mind for some solace and peace uh, than natural greenery. You can look as at, at, at as many shop fronts as you can. The, the busyness, the lights, the, the bling, you know, in the end of the day, where do you find that solace? It's, it's from nature. So if you want to have people spend more time in your location, you just have to plant a tree or fill it with greenery. And, and they can sit there and, and reflect or talk to your friends and feel, especially in this pandemic situation, you can feel the regeneration of... of uh, freshness of fresh air for example yeah so uh, uh spoken like a true romantic <laughs> seems like uh <laughs> calling for for people to get together in in green and i think uh, a lot of us would would agree with that uh, 
the soul does need its food, right? It's not just about uh, purely uh, profit motive. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question here about uh, the Cyberjaya the Cyberjaya Mosque uh, with the ram earth walls. Were there many iterations and formulas before agreeing for the final with the final form? Uh, the mosque is the second project we apply this technique of ramp up. So it was much easier this round because uh, the first project we did on the technique of ramp up wall was a project in Pulau Banding. Um, it's a wave, one of the last stop after Gari, if you drive to the east coast. So the site was uh, pretty remote from the city and we have an issue of uh, accessibility and transportation. And when we went to the site, we, we saw the color of the earth was uh, quite nice and wonderful. So we, from there, we start to use, came up with the ideas and worked together with the, with the builders. It has to be in situ. So they did the mixture on the site. And yeah, we need to do, go through a few mock up uh, in situ at the site. To, to get the right strength on the thickness and also the height, whether how much thickness and what height it can hold. And yeah, it's, it's a process, not a, it's not a formula that you can uh, be applied on uh, UBT, uh, uniformly on, on every side. So uh, every side we have to adjust a bit on the composition of the, the content, uh, depending on the type of the earth and also the cement and the sand. But, but all, all soil is local lo, local soil and you, you didn't have to import any? Yeah, uh, we only use a certain area of the moss, the ramp earth. Uh, the other areas, the, the larger areas we use are also clay bricks. So it's a supplement to, to uh, modern bricks also, yeah. Right, right. It also depends on the color of the earth. So if you happen to be at any site, you can see the color of the earth, whether I mean, it, it can be it can become part of the pigment for for the wall. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, a question for uh, Architect Lawrence. Um, having operated in Penang, yeah, and having done such a wonderful building uh, that is sensibly done uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the urban uh, response and whatnot, but there are many projects in Penang which has. Uh, uh, sort of uh, use the leeway of uh, increasing floor area but still conserving a very small uh, heritage frontage uh, do you have any how how would you how would what's your take on this type of projects where suddenly in front of a small bungalow you have a, a 20 story <laughs> building well i think that uh it's an invitation to really go out and do a bit of blasting right but i shall try and be diplomatic right? <laughs> i think i think the council itself the local authority has drawn up certain guidelines of what constitutes conservation right and in conjunction with um, state planning they will look at how to be a bit more conducive to increased plot ratio or densities so if they say that you are allowed to put a 40-story build, 40 story building behind a two-story building uh, and they justify it as conservation, what do you do as a practicing architect, right? Because it's a, it's a wonderful job to have, but really, we're not talking about heritage conservation anymore. We're not talking about the curtilage. We're not talking about the historic setting. We're talking about dollars and cents and spatial development. So we don't mix the two, right? Mm. And yeah. no matter how we try to promote a sensible approach, I think um, development always wins in the sense that land prices high, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Yeah. But, um, prime, prime places, prime prime yeah. locations. Yeah. But I think sometimes you have to listen to your own conscience, right? Do you or do you not? take on the project pretending that you're doing good conservation work, right? Uh, when you put a old building within an envelope of a new building, practically, and if you want to call it conservation, by all means, right? 
And if you travel overseas, they are also a very good, quote unquote, bad example. So I think one of the things that we would have to really focus on when you talk about what's next is that I think every speaker has within them what uh, Liz calls values. I actually think about critical thinking and about applying some sort of critical thought to the way we do architecture. It's different with each of us, but we have something that we are contemplating, right? Whether it's about uh, solace, whether it's about using uh, natural materials, etc., or even reinventing the brick. Mm -hmm. We actually engage in, in a, a move that makes a difference in the paradigm of architecture in the country. Right? We don't just take on a project and because it's, uh, you have a client and he's, he's going to give you, uh, mm -hmm. you know, good returns, that's it. I think we have to make an effort to look beyond that. Yeah. And I think that's what differentiates the projects. Right? And I really appreciated everyone's approach, which gives me, you know, really thought for new directions. Yeah. Even with the with the mosque, you know, I I had the pleasure to see it while while it was undergoing, you know, the whole analysis. And the end result is wonderful. But we don't we are not celebrating that, you know. We should be celebrating that sort of uh, critical thinking and I, mm -hmm. that's what really no matter what projects you put in the next round i believe those projects will demonstrate what i'm talking the 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 uh transition or uh, the the translation of that substance a conscience to do the correct thing yeah i think that that that, that is a very admirable thing that we need uh, in the practices, uh, in the in the profession as well, because at the end of the day, as you mentioned, uh, Lawrence, is a lot to do with dollars and cents, and um, I think people need to say no a lot more to these type of uh, projects, and and just make 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 it known that uh, it is quite distasteful. And perhaps uh, Elizabeth wants to chip in, being the conservator here. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> she can't wait to say something yeah. about this. <laughs> well, I was I was just thinking, you know, just um, following on uh, somewhat um, from what Lawrence is saying. I think that um, the the working in conservation, one of one of you know the biggest challenges has always been, and working with architects and planners, which is you know the profession I I mainly engage with, is everybody looks at it in a very physical, spatial way. So it's what you see, it's what you can touch, it's what you can feel. I mean, meaning vis vis visible, you know, what's visible. Mm. But I come from a cultural background um, and that's that's my mainstay. And so it's all about what is underlying it, what underpins the physical. So the context within which uh, we look at it, it's so the, the built environment, the, the these heritage resources I work with, these buildings, you know, they're not just resources themselves. You don't, you don't maintain them, you don't restore them just because they're there as a physical thing. It's really what goes into them, how they are used, mm. um, who they belong to. And so if you want to talk about sustaining and sustainability and future sustainability of, of the, we have to think about, you know, how it then applies um, in in the in it, and it is a negotiation. I think it's a negotiation with your paymaster, you know, um, your your developer, your uh, politician, your city hall. Um, um, we cannot be so romantic about it. On the one hand, on the other hand, if we lose all sense of right. romance, um, then it becomes cut and dry and. I suppose for me, you know, it, it isn't a space that I would want to work in um, on a personal level because it is these these values and these memories and which give the space meaning and using that meaning and translating that meaning as architects, um, people working, you know, in, in the built environment, how do you translate that so that 
creates new meaning and it creates meaning while while remembering mm. um leveraging on i suppose building on you know it's like a scaffold right you build upon the past um and i think that that you know uh, boone's example of of creating the bricks i mean it reminds me of a project sorry that uh, boone and <coughs> Lawrence and I worked on many, many years ago, um, State of Merdeka Restoration. And I mm. saw that. I thought, oh, my God, do you remember, Boon, those red bricks that we had to make in the tunnels, you know? And and it was like, and I, and I saw that and I thought, oh, Deja I kind of remember where that came from, you know? Um, because that, that, again, it was part of our learning curve. And then I see it not exactly the same, but being applied in a different way, you know, um, in, in his project. And I think that that is so wonderful i mean in a sense i mean we were restoring a place right. we needed to do something we needed to learn a process uh, it was very difficult uh, because we were talking at that time with contractors with people who didn't understand what we were doing um mm. and then i see this and i go wow you know it, it's really exciting to see that understanding and then how that translates into something which is completely innovative and new and and very compelling and i think that that for me is is what the future is in terms of the built environment where we do not throw things out uh but we do not retain things under glass either as a museum piece it really is about how do you and and the, that navigation that that decision and that that negotiation which is not Mm -hmm. um, architects alone or planners alone or cities citizens alone you know it is about the collective correct um, not easy not but easy, i think definitely. necessary the, uh, there's which, the one word i forgot to mention sorry to break in but uh liz reminded me actually i was thinking of what mock and ching and Wun Ken was, was talking about and it's actually about interpretation of ideas and learning that have come across time, right? And what each of them have done is to interpret. And so the projects that I would love to see are interpretation projects, really, because that's where they translate something that had its origin in one place and eventually finds context in another. Mm -hmm. And this is our job as designers, you know, really to do that. Right. Uh, which segues very well into uh, not uh, not actually a question, but uh, just asking uh, Boon. Uh, you mentioned just now that this uh, this whole presentation is a tribute to the late uh, Alexis Mariada. So maybe you can uh, ex explain a bit about uh, what which part of it is his legacy and. Um, how important it is to him? Uh, well, uh, uh, Alex actually was actually a, a very small setup. Uh, well, he did a lot of projects uh, within the vicinity. But I think the one of the very bold statements within the, the triangle that I mentioned between KLCC and KLTAO, this is one of the most significant projects, I think, in, in his, I think, probably the last projects that he had before he got into all this trouble of help. So I think uh, something that uh, you also always remember uh, him as a, as a great person and also some great guidance for us. Uh, of course, with him ar around, uh, we have a lot of flexibility. But of course, he, he, he like, 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 uh, like Lawrence and Liz uh, used to be, uh, they are, he, he has his own principle that I always work with. So yeah, something that we actually take and learn along, along the way. Yeah, that's thanks, architect Alex. Yeah, just uh, yeah. great to remember him. Yeah, sad to see him him uh, go. Yeah, uh, he he was not that sen he was not that uh, senior, right? Well, he's on his sixties today. I, actually, before he passed away, this is uh, his sixty years so It was actually well, uh, uh, where where we can withdraw our EPF monies. I think that's yeah. time that actually can enjoy his life. But <laughs> well, now the sixties is not considered that old. <laughs> <laughs> well, we uh, use the yeah. EPF as a benchmark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Sp spoken like a like a person who is uh, uh, looking forward to withdrawing. From um, I think uh, we are about to run out of time. Uh, we are supposed to end at five. So I would like to just go around the table to ask you, uh, each one of you, 
perhaps to give um, your opinion on or your sort of like vision of this future uh, the, the future architecture of Malaysia because I think uh, the, the whole idea of this four nations book is to compile uh, wonderful works uh, your all your works are wonderful uh, from the four nations and to look at perhaps to look at the commonalities and the differences. And when we do that, we also discover our own identity in a way. Yeah. So uh, what's your take on uh, our future? Uh, anyone? Nobody dares answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, can, can, I, can I say something? Because it's Pam and yeah, okay. I'm the non-architect here. Um, many, many years ago, in the, in the mid-1970s, Pam put out a little book that was called okay. um, Notable Buildings of Kuala Lumpur. And I okay. don't know whether you remember it, but it was a little, it was a little um, monograph that had, you know, maybe 80 buildings um, that were highlighted in there. And that went through to the 1970s. And they were not so you had earlier buildings through to contemporary buildings of that time. Yeah, the 19th. And if you go over that now, um, and remember it was called Notable Buildings, and these were seen as exemplar. And if you go back to that um, document, if you go back to that monograph, you will see that maybe 20% of the buildings, 25% of them are no longer around. And the ones that have actually all have been substantially changed. So by the time you're looking at changed from that, if you're looking at... And you know which ones they were? They are the contempt. They were the ones which were post Nodeka. And I wonder, as a non-architect, why there, the, you know, uh, uh, buildings like I mean, the, the 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 original. I mean, the KL Hilton, the one that was on, you know, Sultan Ismail, and, and um, even you know, you you say the Ibib, where facades were substantially changed, or 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 there were renovations, or they were just demolished and then replaced. Um, the question always is for me as a non-architect is, you know, when you replace something, yeah, sure, you know, we change baju and things like that, right? You know, do we replace it with something which is better or do we just replace it? And I think that as somebody working in, in, in conservation, you know, I, I think about, you know, what is it that we as as a people as a community uh as people working in the creative sort of uh medium uh what what responsibility do we have in terms of that the the taking on the the, the principles the, the the idea the integrity of of these older designs and bringing them or, or taking from them interpreting as Lawrence used um you know the term um and putting that into practice where that influences greatly, you know, the way in which mm. um, our, architect, our future architecture uh, is, is going not, not just to look like, you know, but to be based upon. Um, uh, right. Architect uh, Cheng Saunin talked about, um, you know, as, as did architect Mok, you know, um, as did Lawrence and Boon Ken, actually. You talk about, you know, um, our climate. And these are the kinds of things mm -hmm. that, that need, you know, that we, we are very conscious about because we talk about sustainability, because we talk about climate change. So, so I, I just kind of want to throw it out there to the architects. You know, it's not about being, having a Malaysian identity. It's learning the principles or remembering, maybe learning again the principles. Yeah, relearning, relearning. That's part of uh, finding yourself. You've perhaps forgotten because some, I mean... Uh, I, don't, I don't mean to people, nag, yeah? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a, it's a discussion. It's a never... Non-architect. Uh, <laughs> can, can I take a thread out of what uh, Liz is saying? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Because there's always some connectivity between the two of us, whether we like it or not. Uh, um, yeah. I think what she's saying now is when we spoke about community, about people, about places with, with, with soul, spaces of the future will be, have to be built in a very collaborative fashion, right? Because it's not just about even the narrow 
range of architects, sociologists, uh, conservationists, engineers, etc. It has to extend across the whole spectrum of uh, intellect, right? Mm -hmm. And when, when all these people are engaged fully in a very complex system of buildings and spaces, those will be the future spaces that we have, right? Mm -hmm. But to, in order to do that, we really have to abandon our own roles in the sense that I'm no longer an architect. I cannot be an architect anymore. I have to be more comprehensive, so to speak, right? But if we stay at being just architects and we stay at looking at buildings per se, uh, mm -hmm. those are the buildings that will fail. Because the, the sustainability is not about building anymore, right? But if we are going to be part of that equation and be the architect within that equation, we will really have to look at spaces that are so diffused and so wide and so large, but coming together in very great detail. This mm -hmm. is what I see the future as, whether we like it or not. Yeah, we, it seems like uh, that there's no choice. Um, uh, Sao-In or Stemo or Boon, you want to chip in? Well, if I can just add on to what uh, Lawrence is saying and what Elizabeth, uh, the, the trouble with architecture by and large is that we lack honesty. We don't delve into what we are building for. We, we pander to the developer's wishes or the homeowner's wishes. And I had to say this, uh, half of them are not thinking uh, about what it should be. They, they just want something because they they think they look, they look good in front of their friends, you know. So I, I have to blame the architects. I blame myself uh, that I have not been honest enough with architecture. And sometimes we, we, we take the first step, which is, you know, brave and, and uh, full of integrity. But as we weather along, you know, under the project managers who just come and go and they keep changing the brief, we get so tired of, of changes. And, and I have to say, there are times that I just gave up, you know, I just gave up. I said, you can have what you want. I'm tired. <laughs> you know, when I look back at all the, the, the principal works that really stood out, uh, the ones that stood for a long time, they were honest. They were honest buildings. True to God, honest. Yeah. Uh, any response, uh, Sa'in or Boon? Um, <clears throat> for me, I think uh, I, when every time I completed a project, I start to realize a lot of uh, mistakes that I made. <laughs> I realize a lot of problems. So um, I think in the future, it would be nice. I think it's like passing the baton. It would be nice mm -hmm. to see more, more other architects, young architects or senior architects also to to discover and also find a solution on the mistakes that i have been made made i i, I always find it's delightful and also to see there's new solution for things that uh, i couldn't achieve at the point of time with the, with the resources i have and i think it's about the process of buildings and then not just when the buildings are completed but also the lifespan of the building after it's completed how the buildings have been maintained, whether they are mm -hmm. they are waterproof and, and how you waterproof it efficiently without having to spend too much and all that. And it mm -hmm. all interrelated and all this at the end, it also make, needs to make um, the the people who inside the building it feels it feels uh, uplifting. So it has to be human. The whole process has to be human. So I think when you strike that that balance, you, you get the perfect balance. Uh, in mm -hmm. in make something that it will really last through time. We love to see that. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Uh, Boon? Yeah. May, may I just add on on that? I think I think I agree yeah, yeah. totally agree yeah. with architect Mark on the honesty of the building. The end list actually the, the building that actually suits now are very simple building. The building that actually address our climate. I mean, uh, we be architect like what architect Mark say. We always suppressed by client. They are over overwhelmed greed. 
Uh, and uh, <laughs> most of the things we build are not sustainable. Well, we, we call them sustainable in a way that, well, we'll please our client to get our money. <laughs> but uh, in fact, the most simple thing, the, the simplest things in the world, like, like for example, the Aura and Asli Hut, they are the most simple, simple structures that we can find and they can actually last quite some time. More than actually probably the buildings that we can build today. So, 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 so in terms of uh, the culture and heritage that we want to culture, it's actually we, we should go for simple honesty i mean honesty is actually the the, the big word uh, on, on it i mean that's my take i mean from all the sifus in this chat rooms <laughs> uh perhaps a, a fitting uh and ending word uh thank you for all your thoughts and very deep ponderous and self-reflective perhaps uh yeah and uh perhaps not just for the young architects but for also the senior Uh, Sally, have we lost you somewhere? Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, I don't know what happened. The <laughs> the one of the perils of online. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you again, for everyone. I think uh, that is we have exceeded our time by two minutes. Uh, let's us wave uh, goodbye to the audience and thank you again for coming. See you guys. Thanks, Sally. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you again. Bye.